Ireland is in the middle of a growing epidemic. By the end of this year, 23,000 people will have been newly diagnosed. By 2020, this number will double to over 45,000 new cases. That's the equivalent of the entire population of Waterford City. The disease is cancer, and as it casts its long shadow over more and more lives, investigators are uniting in the fight against one of humankind's deadliest enemies. Tumours are smart, and once they've been in a fight with uh, toxic poisons using chemotherapy, they kind of put on a bulletproof jacket. So as uh, medical scientists, we have to be much smarter, and we've got to figure out where the weak point is. Irish investigators are now getting a clearer picture of how cancers develop and survive. With this knowledge, new and more effective weapons are being created in the fight against this disease, offering fresh hope to those who are diagnosed. Our expectation will be that we can identify much better treatment protocols for patients that treat their particular type of disease and that these um, patients will then live much longer, much healthier lives with their cancer. When I was a very young research scientist in the early 80s working in America, there was a woman who died of leukemia and the cells that killed her were put into culture in the laboratory. And I have these very cells here with me today. These cells have followed me around the world. And every time I look at them, the hairs in the back of my neck go up because the cells that killed this woman who died from chronic myelocytic leukemia are alive and have achieved an immortality. And I suppose what we're trying to do now is to try and understand how do they do this. Tom Cotter has devoted his career to studying the life and death of cells in our body. He and his team of investigators at University College Cork are working at the cutting edge of science to understand the so-called suicide gene, the gene that tells a cell when it is the right time to die, and the survival gene that tries to stop it. Our bodies are made up of billions of cells and every cell has a life clock that's ticking. And when that clock stops, the cell dies. And in the next year, I'm going to lose a body weight of cells. But I'm also going to generate a body weight of cells. And these two, the survival process and the death process, are very tightly synchronised. Now what happens in some cancers is these are out of sync. And when a cancer cell comes to the end of its life, it refuses to die and it keeps on surviving. Cotter's work originally centered on leukemia, which is a cancer of the blood or of the bone marrow. It's caused by an accumulation of cancer cells in the blood, cells which are now refusing to die. Owen was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia called chronic myelocytic leukemia, or CML, after a routine medical examination for a new job. 29 years old, just bought a house, you know, out drinking, smoking, enjoying myself, and to be told over the phone that you had cancer was just an unbelievable shock. At the time, because I was relatively young and relatively healthy, uh, I had a survival rate of 70% for five years, which scared me. In the, the early to mid-90s, we really didn't know how the gene that causes chronic myelocytic leukemia works. And what we found, I guess, in probably a seminal paper in the mid-90s, was that what this gene does is it gives a very strong survival signal to the CML cell. The big difference between a normal cell and a cancer cell is that a cancer cell needs a strong survival message to survive. 
and this survival message has to travel from the outside of the cell right through the inside of the cell into the nucleus. And I'll give you a visual metaphor of how this works. It's like a relay race where the runners are carrying a baton, passing it from one runner to the next, and this baton is a survival message. This is a cancer cell survival pattern. What's happening here is the signal is going from the outside of the cell in through the cell, heading towards the nucleus. And you can see the message being passed from one runner to the next runner. And these are like proteins inside of the cell. This is what's happening. And the message is passed to the last runner who takes it into the nucleus. Now the nucleus has got the signal to survive and the cancer cell is happy. And what we're trying to do as research scientists is try and stop that survival signal from getting into the nucleus. And again, to return to my visual metaphor, we're looking at the runners in the relay team, passing the survival message, and we're trying to identify the weakest link in that relay team and target that weakest link by using drugs that will stop that individual dead and prevent the message from getting into the nucleus of the cancer cell. And if you can do that successfully, then that cancer cell is going to die. Cotter was successful. He identified the rogue gene which was sending out the extremely strong survival message that was keeping cancer cells like Owens alive. And I think with this knowledge, a large piece of the jigsaw puzzle was put together. Uh, this was, I think, capitalised on by several other labs and also by a particular pharmaceutical company who went on to develop a very highly effective drug. The consultant suggested to me uh, going on to Gleevec, which was a relatively new at the time. I think there was only two other people in the matter who were on Gleevec, as opposed to your traditional chemotherapy, bone marrow transplant, with all the inherent risks of those. And Gleevec being the golden bullet at the time, didn't have the traditional side effects, and I was out of hospital within two weeks. Like the baton being passed between the runners in the relay race, the message to survive is fed continuously into the nucleus of the cancer cell. Gleevec has been successful because it manages to stop that message in its tracks so that the cancer cell dies without harming any of the surrounding healthy cells. There's little question it's a groundbreaking moment. It's a classic example of targeted therapy where instead of using non-specific cytotoxic agents that poison the cells and the patient, we now have targeted therapies that hit what's broken in the cancer cell or the leukemia cell. And in the case of CML, it's revolutionized our treatment. Targeted chemotherapy has allowed me to progress, have two children, uh, progress in my job, a lot of travel, basically live as normal. The results are remarkable. Compared to our traditional chemotherapy where we threw in poisons and hoped to kill more bad cells than good cells, patients take a pill and it's very targeted to what's broken and the outcome data have been remarkably different and the improvement in response and survival has been dramatic. So it's a real success story and uh, I think in the area of cancer you don't hear too many of those. Long term I'm hopeful that a cure will be found for my cancer. At the moment I'm living with my cancer, it doesn't really impinge my life that much, but psychologically in the back of your mind you always have that worry that it'll come back again. For me research is extremely important that next generation of drugs will eradicate the cancer and get that monkey off my back. The key to any cancer investigation is the availability of live cancer cells to study. Tom remains indebted to that brave woman who died back in the 1980s and donated her cells for research. You know, I'd love to go back and say, look, thank you very much for the help that you've given, not only to the research community, but also to all these other patients out there. They have you to thank for in the fight against cancer. There's little question this is all very exciting, but it is still all in its early days. The kinds of approaches that have been used for leukemia and now other cancers to identify the pathways are being broadened across the other malignancies. If you look at the success stories we've had in the whole cancer field, I think the main one over the last 20 odd years has been in the treatment of leukemia. And I guess between 75 and 85% of leukemias are now curable. Now, when you look at solid tumours, it's a completely different kettle of fish. These are much more difficult to deal with. Solid tumours are essentially masses of cancer cells which are multiplying in an uncontrolled manner. They can be treated by surgery, radiation and or chemotherapy. And usually there's a high success rate for primary tumours. But the problem is the tumour comes back. Now, tumours are smart and once they've been in a fight, with a, a, a toxic poison that's used in chemotherapy. They kind of put on a bulletproof jacket and then they disappear into different corners of the body so you can find them. So A, you've got to find where they are 
and B, you've got to find some way of getting in behind that bulletproof jacket. I was diagnosed the day after the mini marathon last year in St Luke's Hospital and the first thing I said to the doctor was I'm going to die and he said not at all, he said we can control this cancer, we can't cure it but we can control it and I felt happier about that but then I had to tell my dad and my family and they were all just devastated, it was, it, it was just really hard for them and I haven't got to cry now because it was hard for them. I'll never forget that day. Marie Lochney is someone who benefits from previous patient studies and who in turn contributes to new research. Marie was first diagnosed with breast cancer five years ago. Even though the course of chemotherapy was successful at the time, the cancer has returned. This time, it's in her bones. So if you look at survival pathways in a primary tumour, the survival pathway is about here. Now if you look in secondary tumours, the survival pathway or the strength of the signal goes up here. Now that gives us a real problem in treating these patients because what happens is that you get a good response in the primary tumour. But when the secondary tumour comes back, the drugs that work in the primary tumour down here simply won't work in the tumours up here. And that's in essence one of the major clinical problems that we have in cancer treatment today. So as scientists what we're trying to do is trying to get drugs that will actually work on cancers that have the survival pathway up here. The outlook for cancer patients in Ireland is good, but it could be a lot better. Ultimately, the, the role of treating people with cancer in Ireland falls to the state. It falls to the Department of Health and the HSE. So it's crucial that the Irish Cancer Society gets the Department of Health to do more, gets the Health Services Executive to do more. Well, the model for the future is very much having a team approach, having a doctor, having a scientist working alongside him or her, and more and more what we want to do is, is to take the research that we're doing to the bedside. And that's where translational research comes in. Translational research refers to the, the continuum which now exists between investigations which take place in the laboratory and actual research which takes place involving patients, actual cancer sufferers at the bedside. In the past, these two processes were somewhat separate. We were doing research with older drugs like chemotherapy agents, drugs which had not had a, a particularly rational development process, which, but which had, through trial and error, been shown to have a beneficial effect in cancer patients. We are now doing virtually exclusively translational trials, where new molecular pathways are identified by the scientists, new drugs are developed by the pharmacologists, which are then brought to us through a developmental process so that we can explore what's the best and most effective way to give them to patients with cancer. The investigators really are translational research. It's the people who make that happen. And the investigators are the critical portions of that, sitting on both the basic side and the clinical side, but very close to one another in terms of the interaction. Rob O'Connor's work focuses on one of the most challenging areas of cancer research, the especially stubborn cancer cells with these high survival pathways. Our work here in the National Institute for Cellular Biotechnology primarily focuses on resistance to uh, cancer drugs. Cancer cells are treated by a number of different types of chemotherapy drugs. In some cases the cells respond very well to treatment, but in other cases we know that patients fail to respond. And we're investigating why that's happening, why cancer cells are becoming resistant to therapy, and how we can overcome that resistance that will allow us to improve the treatment of patients and improve treatment of resistant cancer. The strategy that Rob and his team are using is known as combination therapy. Instead of developing new drugs, they've been combining existing cancer drugs with treatments for a variety of other conditions and have had some spectacular results. So our laboratory investigations identified that there was potential synergy between this arthritis drug and an existing cancer drug. Synergy being that we were seeing a greater effect than we would expect uh, just with the agents on their own. So here we have a picture of uh, live cancer cells derived from an Irish cancer patient. And we can see here that the chemotherapy drug is really only getting into two of these cancer cells. And if we switch over to a view where we've um, put in another drug to inhibit the resistance mechanism, we can see a lot more brightness, which is indicating that the chemotherapy drug is actually getting into all of the cells here and is going to kill these cancer cells. 
And this just shows, similar to a, an MRI, so we can see the cell in sort of three dimensions and see where the drug is going. We can see it's focusing primarily in the nucleus, which is where we want the drug to go to kill the cancer cell. Here was a major breakthrough. O'Connor had identified two seemingly unconnected drugs, which, when combined, were having a real impact. The next stage was to see how they'd perform in humans. This was done through a process of clinical trials. This was an early stage clinical trials. Typically, we start out by identifying what are the optimal doses, then we identify whether the drugs actually work in patients. We did this very successfully. Two patients where their tumour shrank, and four patients where their tumour stayed the same size. And this is a, a major advance because the group of patients were very advanced cancers, very actively growing. So six patients saw a major treatment benefit. Our next stage is to go on to a more advanced clinical trial, specifically in the disease melanoma, which we have identified as a good target for our combination therapy. So we've initiated a five-centred uh, clinical trial in Ireland, um, which will evaluate whether our combination has uh, improved activity in that disease in melanoma. Uh, you must remember that we have a poorish health system now. It was very bad from the oncology point of view 10 years ago. And those that were in authority in the health service truly believed that research was a, a frivolity. A good going group of people here decided we wanted to change that mold and we wanted to actually continue our involvement in clinical research. And we've now moved from a position when Ireland had virtually no representation in clinical trials to a situation where we are now leading trials throughout the world. Okay, well everybody, you're all very welcome to this operations meeting. Um, we're going to take the opportunity to update people on a few studies and I guess get some information on where we are with a variety of projects that we have. O'Connor is part of the research and trial organisation known as ICORG, which establishes and runs cancer trials for Irish patients. One of the benefits of ICORG's work is that Irish investigators are now recognised as being on a par with the best investigators around the world. The research that this work has brought to the centres is giving their patients access to drugs that in many cases they wouldn't have had access to otherwise. To date, one of our more exciting involvements has been in the trials that helped develop the drug Lapatinib, a very new and novel way of treating advanced breast cancer. Following the initial success of the Lapatinib drug trial, St James's Hospital in Dublin is one of the centres now using the drug to treat a range of other cancers. John Kennedy is the current head of ICORG and is also Marie Lochney's consultant. I didn't really know too much about the clinical trials and he explained them to me what, what it would be. And when he explained it to me, I was delighted because I think I get the best care. I really do now. From going to the hospital every week, you're, you know, you're seen to straight away. You're scanned every month. If any new cancer did show up anywhere, you're caught in time. I just feel very lucky to be picked for the trial because not every woman is suitable. Why I said yes is because I want to live. I want to beat this cancer and I want to live. And anything to help me live, I'll take it. This is our day clinic, so uh, patients who are getting chemotherapy are coming back in today to get their treatment and then they go home afterwards. It's all outpatient care. So most medical oncology care nowadays is day care treatment. Many of the patients are on clinical trials, so uh, we have to record any side effects that they might have had on experimental agents who might deal with any problems they have. You know, you can't draw any lessons from the, from the therapy unless you know exactly what it's doing for the patients. So you have to have very detailed documentation of how they do on the treatments. All right, how are things? Great. Good form? Well, no problems? No problems at all. Good. Absolutely great. How's the pain in your leg? A little bit on Sunday, but I was very active. My three-year-old knees kept me very active, but yeah. it went. So it's really a question of monitoring the safety yeah. and uh, side effects okay. and, the, and the effectiveness of the treatment as well, of course. The same kind of thing, obviously, is for most of the patients, but the patients on, a, on clinical trials need to have that documented in a very rigorous uh, way, so. No problems with that. Let's go down and get your bloods drawn and make sure everything is okay and then we'll get to your treatment. Okay, Thank let's go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. In the global scheme of things, we're not going to develop any new treatments at all for anybody uh, or any better treatments for anybody unless we have patients who are on clinical trials. I can sit down and tell a patient with a certain disease today that they should have a certain type of treatment because clinical trials have told me that that's the best treatment they can get. But if we don't do clinical trials, that'll never happen. So we won't develop any new treatments unless we have patients on trials. So we owe, a, uh, everybody I think owes a great debt of gratitude to patients who are going to go on clinical trials because they are developing the treatments of the future. We're looking at better individualization of cancer treatment for patients, treating the specific disease that that patient is suffering from, using agents more intelligently, having less side effects, and allowing the patient to live with their disease over years with low toxic 
uh, chemotherapy drugs rather than the highly toxic chemotherapy drugs that we've tended to use in the past. We always hear on Wednesday the same group of us and we have a chat and we talk and how have you been and what did you do the weekend and sometimes we'd have bad days, good days and bad days but we understand because we're going through the same thing, you know. We want every patient to have the right to join a trial if they've been diagnosed with cancer. Now it is their right to join or not to join, but if we're not giving them the opportunity to join, I believe we're denying them a right. Well, the clinical trials give us an enormous amount of information. First of all, it gives us just how the new drug compares, either in combination or as a standalone, to our best available standard therapies. But in addition, if the materials collected from the tumor tissue, serum, blood, the things that are collected on the clinical trial, we learn how to better use the drug, how to better develop the drug in the context of the patient to deliver even more optimum therapy. So there's an enormous amount of data beyond just does it work better that comes out of a clinical trial. It, in and of itself, is a whole research process that goes beyond just the one question. I have a CT scan every month. It's protocol from the trial company. And every month, my heart is in my mouth. I'd say a week before coming up to the scan, I used to say, this time next week, I'll know whether the cancer has spread or not. It's the most terrifying thing. You know, like, say three weeks of the month, I'm on cloud nine, and for one week, I'm really, really scared. It's, it's I can't describe, it's just the fear, the biggest fear you have. This is the time that I don't like, because you're waiting a few days for the results. At the back of my mind, it'll always be there. What if it's not good news? What if, you know, it's not going to be okay, but at least God, it will be. As Marie waits for her latest scan results, Rob O'Connor is examining all the information gathered from her trial and other lapatinib trials like it. This cycle of information is helping him prepare a new treatment for a new series of trials for cancer patients in the future. We've been investigating lapatinib, which we sourced from a pharmaceutical company, and we found uh, an unusual combination effect when we uh, used that with uh, existing chemotherapy drugs. So we're just going through the final stages there uh, at the meeting with our ICOR colleagues, and if there's any last minute hitches, paperwork that needs to be uh, sorted out. So I guess that brings us on, Rob, to your proposals. Where are we with that? Hey, that's nearly ready to go now. We've gotten ethical and regulatory approval uh, through the, the hard work of the iCorg Central Office. We have a couple of minor things to work out with the drug company, and I guess we hope to enrol the uh, first patient probably two weeks' time, approximately. Mm -hmm. So everything, all the regulatory stuff is in place? Yep. We're ready to go soon. Well, that's fantastic. Great. It's three days since Marie underwent her CT scan, and now she and her father, Patrick, return to St. James's for the results. You know, we'd be nearly crying. We'd be holding hands there, myself and my dad waiting, and Dr. Kennedy give us the results. We'd be sitting there holding hands, you know. I'm looking at his, his, his face, as he, you know, has he got good news or bad news from him? So far, it's always been grand, thank God. I got the good news that everything is okay, um, my disease is stable. Um, that's the way it's been for the last year. So it's good news all around. I'm just over the moon. <laughs> really happy. Yeah. So I'll just move on now. So I'm just get on now with my life. Get back to being normal and being happy again. That's it. This cycle of translational research continues as Marie celebrates her positive news for this month. Rob's latest cancer trial is just days away, offering the hope of more successful scan results for patients like Marie in the future. However, the fact remains that in our lifetimes, one in three of us will be diagnosed with cancer, and one in four of us will die from it. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, there are probably two or three things we need to do about it. We need to improve our diagnostic and screening procedures. We need to develop better therapeutic drugs so we can kill the cancer. And to enable us to do that, we need to do more research. Cancer is a very complex disease, and really we're only going to advance things by scientists getting together with clinicians and nurses and the various people involved in, in the treatment of cancer, us coming together and speaking the same language and working using the latest technology, the latest drugs, and the latest forms of treatment to advance um, better treatments for patients. If you are diagnosed with cancer, it's not the end of the world. I never thought I'd be here a year later. 
and I felt better than I've ever felt. I enjoy my life much more, I appreciate my life much more. So go in there and get help and talk to people and talk to the support network and don't be afraid. If you don't do research, you're not going to develop any new cures. And how are you going to tell your grandchildren that you can't treat their cancers if you're responsible for not funding cancer research? So research is absolutely vital for the future generation. Thank mm -hmm. you.